My name is Kamal Franklin. I'm an organizer from, at this stage, from Atlanta, but originally from Brooklyn. Uh, I've been doing community organizing for over 30 years. I used to be a practicing attorney, a movement attorney, um, but I gave that up to get back into organizing full time. So thank you guys for letting me spend a few minutes just to talk to you about my views and or concerns and what I see happening in the future. Um, I titled the talk, The Return of Overt White Supremacy. Uh, because I believe, obviously, I think that white supremacy has already been here, right? It's the foundation of which the country is based on. And for some of us, in terms of talking about fascism, we understand it because our lives have been lived under a fascist regime, right? So for Africans in America, fascism has already, already been here, right? What is fascism? Well, what is the brown shirts if it's not the Klan, if it's not slave owners? If it wasn't police, if it's not vigilantes, if it's not the FBI, right? That is a fascist regime that has control over certain populations of people's lives. And so we go to iterations through history where things, of course, adjust and change. And then sometimes we get them back in different forms, in different ways, but they re re repeat certain crisis moments that we've been at before. So I definitely agree that we're in the last... It, this phase of like the next 20, 30 years, I don't know when the whole thing is ending. I can't predict that per se, but we're definitely in a crisis moment. But it's a crisis moment based on the history of the country. Um, the other thing I like to point out is because when we talk about the way in which fascism or the way in which white supremacy works, that we also can see a return on, it's the very culture of the society, right? So we had a time where lynchings were public exhibitions mm -hmm. to be celebrated, mm -hmm. where people brought their kids, where postcards were taken and sold above ground in common consumer stores, minstrel shows, right? So there's been time periods in this country where the overtness of white supremacy has been clear for all. And like in the past, what we're happy, what's happening now is that you have a critical mass, if not a majority, of people who are comfortable with that white supremacy, right? Who are okay living in that because they feel like they benefit. Whether or not, obviously, it's the elite who manipulate or whether or not we're talking about majority working class whites who think they get something out of it as opposed to needing to defeat it. So we're entering a period that we've seen before. We went through a period we call like the second reconstruction, right? The civil rights movement, the black power movement where things were changed somewhat overtly, where there was an underground or a quietness to white supremacy, where instead of using certain terms or words, things became more coded. So when we talk about what happened in the late 60s, I know we have a few folks here who actually lived the experience, right? But when we talk about what happened in terms of the success of those moments, right, we can deem some of those moments successful and we should, was that it chased some of the overtness of white supremacy away, right? It didn't destroy white supremacy, right? But it did chase away some of the more overt influences or aspects of how white supremacy worked. So we had Nixon, who instead of calling names overtly, used the idea of the solid majority, right? We had, we had war on drugs type of language. We had Reagan with welfare queen, queens. We had Bush with the Willie Horton. Clinton with sister soldier mm -hmm. and welfare reform, right? So folks could not, they had buzzwords and things that they did to relate, but they could no longer overtly do it. But the state didn't go away. The state did what it always does in a fascist society. It beat back the militant forces of organizing and radical work and revolution. So what came out of the 60s was the destruction of the radical movement. It, was, it didn't just fall apart. It wasn't just based on interceding uh, fights and disagreements amongst, amongst folks. It was overtly destroyed, right? The black power movement, the radical movements of the 60s and 70s were attacked, not only through COINTELPRO, but via COINTELPRO, we like that there's a little way in which we approach talking about COINTELPRO, we say it's the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover. 
Wasn't J. Edgar Hoover a bad person and now that he's gone, that's been removed. J. Edgar Hoover was just a point person. This was a federal government operation. He did as he was told. He did his job. He was rewarded for it. The FBI building was named after him. Right? He did what he was told to do, which was to destroy, kill, murder, disrupt, stop, end militant organizing. And in its place, what we got was a turn to, not, it was, it was, it was, it's been there since, let's say, post NAACP, but it really went hard, let's say, was the uh, nonprofit industrial complex. Right? The idea that we, and we all have them, right? So none of us are excluded from the, from the analysis. The idea that somehow we were going to make radical and revolutionary change through a system in which rich foundations give us money to overthrow them. <laughs> and again, we all buy into it. We all buy into it. We may think that we're maneuvering, that we're trying to, you know, make sure that we don't go as far as some other groups that we've seen, but we're all a part of that ecosystem. So as militants were destroyed and retreated, what was allowed was this system of nonprofit industrialization, which turned people firmly into the hands of the Democratic Party. Right? Where do movements go to die? They go to the Democratic Party. Right? So we've had militant movements of people who use militant language or strong language today that they do what? Basically, they talk about policy within the Democratic Party. They ask Joe Biden to go take something. They ask us to vote for Joe Biden. They ask us to vote for moderates as if that's a major shift that we're undertaking to fight against fascism and or white supremacy. But as we have to understand it, the state knows that by moving us in that direction, we become an arm of the state. And then there are outliers who can more be, be more easily attacked. Even if we don't like their politics, or they like, like today, I just read something that was sent by Kali about the Uhuru movement. Some of you may or may not have heard of the Uhuru movement. Uhuru movement uh, is a, a long-term organization, an organization with a long lifespan. It's pan-African, it's revolutionary nationalist, um, and there may be qualms about some of the ways in which it operates, to be honest. But it's just recently been moved on by the FBI saying that it is helping as an unindicted co-conspirator, that it's helping the Russians spread Russian pop propaganda. And the, the movement, the folks that we know who say they represent political organizing or radical organizing, have been silent. They haven't used their large social media platforms to speak out against it. They haven't used their ability with the hundreds of millions they got in resources to say how this is wrong. Because they understand, whether purposefully or not, that they are part of the state apparatus at this stage. Our movement is now part of us uh, attached to the hip of the state apparatus. At least people who say they are from the, or people who claim they are part of the movement. And a lot of them come from movement organizing backgrounds. So we're in a place where the state itself has captured movement politics and then those of us who consider ourselves to still be outside of that are small, unorganized. We have our own fights, which may or may not be bored on by the state. We battle ideology, which separates us. So we have one group of 15 or 20 people and then 10 minutes later, after we have a fight, we have a group, two groups of seven people, right? And then we think that's going to win a revolution or change how fascism works in the country. The rise of the, of the unrestrained right probably came back to us, right, during the Obama era. Obama, who is nothing but a, li a liberal moderate, right? Liberal to moderate, Democrat but was seen as a threat to certain on the ground forces, right? So it's not about whether or not we thought he was gonna do something. Somebody else 
made to claim and others brought into it, right? So what we had was the demographic shifts, five minutes, okay. So what we had was, I was wondering what that tone was. What we have is the demographic, demographic shifts that are happening during that time period, some of which which allowed Obama to win, right? The worrisomeness of, again, working class whites exploited by the white elite, not exclusively, but obviously, but mostly, that folks were losing their country, right? That's the language, that they were losing their country. They already felt like they were being disempowered because for a couple of decades before that, there was deindustrialization, de right? Regular jobs were being moved overseas. Pensions were being destroyed, right? People felt like others were benefiting where they were not. As serious as some of that is, and then other parts of it were delusional, it was all within a mix. And so when the Great Recession happened, which also further, right, brought people's ability to take care of themselves and their families down, Obama was used for the right wing as a boogeyman, right? And what happened under that time period? And ever since that time period, every year, practically every year, is the highest, highest proportion of guns sold in the country. Every year, we reach a new height. We have the rise of the Tea Party, a place for the right wing to feel at home as they again as somewhat the elite is driving it it also drives itself on the ground to be honest where some elites try to catch up to it and get in front of it and they think they're going to control it but there's no doubt that this part of it is a mass movement on the ground whether we like it or not it is a critical mass of people who are thinking a certain way, who are thinking they want to take back their country, and they're forming with those guns militias. They've always, always been a part of it, but even now it's even deeper, a part of the military apparatus, a part of the police apparatus. They are there on the ground. Trump crystallized a moment for these people. Whether or not we think he's an idiot, whether or not we think he's not the smartest person in the world, he crystallized a moment of them feeling un uh, dis disempowered. And that moment was written all the way to the office that holds the most power in the world. And this wasn't just happening here, it was happening all across the, the world. Other right-wing parties were developing with the idea that immigration was happening in Europe which means the countries would not be as white as they once were. So for all the liberals in France who love, like, like you know, constitutional democracy, the main, the, as soon as sort of uh, more brown folks come into the country, they get awfully white. Yeah. They get awfully white supremacists, right? So we have to look at the fact that this history is being repeated in different ways, but it's coming back to a time period where overt white supremacy is going to be accepted and is allowed. Statements that are made by a president when that president was in power, which were shocking at one point for 30 years, were no longer shocking. So we have to get prepared for that. We have to understand that the world of fascism is upon us. And again, I don't know when, I can't predict. You know, radicals are famously, left radicals are famously bad at predicting the fall of capitalism, right? <laughs> but we do understand that we're entering a period of so much danger. When we talk about the, the economy, the ecology, what's happening with politics on the ground. We should use this time wisely so that we can come together and figure out how do bands like this create the structure the infrastructure, the organization, the ability to make moves, the ability to support each other. Because others are already organized. We are not. And if we don't use this time wisely, all the things that David talked about, it'll be too late. Mm -hmm. We already know, and I'll end on this, two, two quick points. We already know from our history, right, that there's index cards. We were reading about this the other night again index cards with the names of radicals that were always taken so that when things go bad, according to them, they know who first to round up.
That's been in the government's files from, since at least the 1950s. Probably before that, but at least the 1950s. So we know, they already know who you are. To be honest, they do. So you have to be willing and ready to respond by being more organized than ever. This is not a time for us not to be organized. And to wrap it up with a quote also from George Jackson, George told us, settle your quarrels, come together, understand the reality of our situation, understand that fascism is already here, the people are already dying, who could be saved? That generation, more, more that generation will live poor butchered lives, half lives, if you fail to act. Do what must be done. Discover your humanity and your love and revolution. Thank you for having me.